Institute for Therapeutic Immunology and Infectious Disease. And last year, he was included in the Time Magazine's 100 Most Influential People in recognition for his contribution in HIV treatments. So for those who are watching now, if you have any questions for the speakers, please post them in the specific web page, which its link should be available in the events page on Facebook, YouTube, Assume. So um, to kickstart, um, I would like to have some warm up questions for our speakers. I would like to seek clarifications first on the understanding on variants. So Professor Peacock, people, they often come across terms like mutation, you know, such as the N501Y mutation, and variants mm. like the B117, and some people then record it as you know, the UK variants on the news. And, mm. and I understand that people, they do get quite confused on those terminologies. So mm. actually, what are the differences between mutation, variant, and strains? Mm. It's a complicated area, isn't it? And I'm not at all surprised that people are quite confused by it because there's lots of, of different names and numbers and so on, which can be really difficult to get to grips with. Mm. First thing to say is I wouldn't use the word strain. It's uh, the, the, the virus, the SARS-CoV-2 is the strain of the virus. And so we should generally avoid, avoid referring things uh, to things as strain. Now, a mutation is a single change in the genetic code of the virus. It's like a kind of typo, if you like. So mm. a point in the, the genetic code is an RNA virus with uh, 30,000 different letters in that. A mutation is um, a single change in the genetic code. So if we look at mutations and, and we, we go back to what you're talking about N5R1Y, for example. So the mutations we really worry about are those that lead to changes in the amino acid that that bit of, of RNA is going to code for. And that's important because amino acids build proteins. And if there's a change in the amino acid, there could be a change in the structure or the function. In other words, how that, how that virus behaves. So we're focusing on mutations that do change uh, the amino acid. And so, for example, when we say the mutation D614G, that means that uh, the mutation has led to a replacement or a substitution of an amino acid and aspartic acid to a glycine substitution at the position 614 in the genome. And we really focus largely here on the spike gene, which encodes the, the spike on the, on the surface of the virus that interacts with human cells. So that's, um, that's how we describe mutations, and that's the nomenclature for that. Now, a variant is used a lot, and that really describes the whole sequence of the virus. And it may contain one or multiple mutations in the, in the 30, uh, 30 uh, kilobases of, of nucleotides of the genome. And so that's describing the entire entirety. Now, if we come on to lineage, mm -hmm. that's like a descendant of the family. It's like a family tree. So um, initially, when the virus first emerged, there was a single virus, and then it divided off. And if you think about a sort of family tree in your own family, you can see how things divide and divide and divide. And, and so we use a lineage to really refer to descendants on the branch of a phylogenetic tree that's being uh, created by comparing one genome to, say, a reference genome. Now, unfortunately, there are three systems of naming, or three main systems for naming of lineage. Um, the one that we use in the UK um, is, uh, we, we would call, for example, the variant that first uh, was detected in Kent, B117. And that's just a nomenclature um, developed by a kind of a tool called, called Pango. So, mm -hmm. But there are different ways of describing this, but that's all a lineage actually means. Now, finally, you were mentioning a country in general, it's a good principle to try and avoid saying that a variant is a UK variant or a South African variant or Brazil variant. Um, you can never be sure where something has emerged, where it's definitely emerged, unless you get the, the very first case, and that's very unlikely to happen. However, what I would say, it's become quite common to refer to uh, something as the South African variant or the Brazilian variant. And I think that's because it's actually quite complicated to um, remember the numbers and it's much easier to revert to uh, the country name but it, that's somewhat unfortunate because it, ha it runs the risk of, of, of being unfair to that country that's often doing more sequencing than other countries and have detected it so, so but that has generally come into sort of common parlance. What we should avoid saying is things like double mutant or triple mutant because that has no meaning at all really 
Mm. And so I do try and avoid avoid that. But so one can see how that uh, that kind of way of describing can be uh, quite um, quite difficult to grasp. Um, but uh, that's that's those those are the uh, those are the explanations for the definitions that you've that you've raised. Mm. But how about variants of concern and variants under investigation? So yes. what are the differences yeah. between them? Yes, well, there's there's two categories that we could talk about here. One is variant of interest, which is the term uh, used by the WHO and CDC, and variant of inve under investigation, really, but that's used by Public Health England. And they mean the same thing, really. So what we're talking about here is a variant that might be of interest to the pandemic control and to humans, but the level of evidence is quite circumstantial at that point. So a variant might have specific genetic markers, for example, that have been associated in other variants with changes in their behaviour. For example, they may be more transmissible or they may have partial immune escape. Uh, 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 they may have greater disease severity. And so what you're doing is you're looking at the genome and saying, in other, in other lineages, uh, we think this might be important. So it might be important in this, in this, in this variant. Plus it's been identified to cause community transmission or multiple outbreaks. So that's where you're kind of worried um, that something might be happening, but you have to, it, it's a signal really to start investigating that very carefully. So it's mm -hmm. like that, that's when you start to investigate. Now, a very of concern is really where you've got more than circumstantial evidence. So you've really got more evidence that there's a cause and effect. So in an area where you've got a lot of outbreaks or trans, uh, uh, transmission in the community, then you may assign um, a particular variant with that characteristic once it's undergone much more detailed study and investigation. So for me, uh, they're quite similar, but it's all to do with levels of evidence by which you can say that there's something that looks as if we really need to watch that and watch how it behaves and actually study in the laboratory through laboratory investigations. Mm. And one where, where you know, there's, there's growing evidence that there really is an issue with that variant. And, so, you know, we have three global variants of concern at the moment that have reached that threshold of evidence where people, you know, are clear that the event has one or more detrimental uh, behaviours in terms of transmission and or immune escape. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, Professor Peacock, you mentioned about more trans transmissibility of the, of the mm -hmm. variants, the possible mm -hmm. transmission issue on that. Professor Gupta, I'd like to jump to you on that because I um, noticed that you and your team you know, have developed um, a rapid COVID test. So actually, um, in terms of variants, um, is there any challenges posed by variants in terms of diagnostic tests? Is there, is there any like extra effort scientists they possibly need to do to keep the test up to date in detecting variants? Um, Professor Gibson, I'm afraid you have muted. I'm muted. Yeah. <laughs> there's no um, there's no evidence that uh, a, a rapid diagnostic tests uh, at present are affected by um, uh, uh, the variants of concern. Uh, however, of course, one of the uh, the variants for uh, uh, B117 is affected um, by a particular diagnostic test that was used in mass testing in the UK. And that actually helped to identify the B117, and it's um, a test by Thermo Fisher, uh, and, that, and and that has been actually used as a tool to track uh, uh, a particular deletion in the spike protein. That's in present in a number of different variants. Uh, but but in terms of routine di routine testing, uh, that's rapid. There isn't there, 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 there is no problem at the moment. Uh, again, for lateral flow antigen tests. Uh, we don't think that the variants are, are, are affected because many of them target the N uh, gene. And so for now, uh, we are in a, in a, good, a good space in that you know, a, a, a big problem would be a compromise of our diagnostic assays by the variants, but at present that doesn't seem to be a pro an issue. But it does require ongoing monitoring and, and groups around the world are uh, checking that new variants are still detectable by uh, nucleic acid tests and also mm. serological tests. Mm. So you mentioned that at the moment there aren't any problems, but then um, is there any evidence showing that such problems might arise in the future or, or in the past when we look at other types of variants, where there such problems um, happened before because of the variants and then the diagnostic testing just deemed ineffective anymore? 
Well, many diagnostic tests use, all good diagnostic tests will use more than one target. So the key thing is that when you have a mul multiple targets that you're detecting, even if you lose one of them, you still, you're still going to get a positive test from the other one or the other two targets. It would be, uh, it's unlikely that you'll lose all of the targets in a, in a, in a, in a good test. So, so the key thing is to have high quality testing, really. Mm, I see. Well, that's a short to know that. I mean, our diagnostic tests are still useful in detecting. Um, Professor Peacock, I would like to go back to you. So you were actually described by some media as, you know, the coronavirus variant hunter. And you actually mm. helped set up the COVID-19 Genomics UK Consortium. Mm. Um, could you share with us how does your team monitor any new variants? Mm. Yes, I'd be really pleased to talk about COG UK, which stands for the COVID-19 Genomics UK Consortium. So you really need to cast your mind back to um, uh, March of 2020, um, when uh, it was clear to us in the UK that we would need to set up large-scale genome sequencing uh, in order to track the virus. Um, it's no great surprise uh, that the virus will change through um, evolution, a natural process. And some of those changes might be important in uh, the changes that we'd really want to know about. So back in, uh, by, by April, uh, we had uh, received funding from the government um, to set up uh, COG UK, it's, that, that's how we abbreviate it. Uh, and the idea was to actually be able to sequence um, uh, the virus across the country. So at the moment, there are around 400 people working in the consortium, mostly volunteers still actually, and mostly in academic institutions. And so this is an, uh, an academic uh, led network um, and it also involves our four public health agencies. So we have four countries in the UK, each has its own public health agency, and they are involved very much in the consortium, together with the Wellcome Sanger Institute, which in the UK is our biggest sequencing capability. So we work together as a team. We have 16 different sequencing uh, sites across the UK, plus the Sanger. And we, uh, we draw samples from hospitals from 117 different hospital labs at the moment. That's our current count. Um, and our big, what we call lighthouse testing labs, that's the mega labs that test community samples. So they all go into a sequencing pipeline. Now, we're sequencing around 55% of all uh, positive cases at the moment. Um, and uh, we, we have, uh, it's very key that we have a particular sampling strategy. So we need to make sure that we get viruses to sequence where we haven't added any selection at all. So from across the country, unselected uh, so that we understand what's happening across the country without any prior hypothesis or concern but we also sequence uh, when we're doing uh, 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 sequencing viruses from people returning from overseas people are going into hotel quarantine people are going into home quarantine um, and uh, also surge testing and so this if there's a variant of concern then that particular area has a very high level testing we sequence those so we generate uh, uh, data every day that's uploaded into our database, we call that CLIME, um, and that's where public health agencies can bring together the very detailed clinical and epidemiological information and examine the data. So public health agencies are responsible for daily horizon scanning for any variants of, of, of interest. And so they, they have a, a system whereby they have quite a few on a monitoring list um, and only some of those will move into a very or under investigation. Um, and so that, uh, that uh, uh, as I say, that occurs regularly. And, and they have particular criteria uh, for reasons why they would start to monitor, for example, if there's um, more than five importations into the UK, for example, with the same mutations, or um, if there seems to be a rapid expansion of that particular uh, variant, um, or if, if there's been an international alert. So that's, that's how it, it, it works, more or less. Mm, so it's really like a, a teamwork, a concerted effort yes, during this it is, yeah. work. And I think the thing to say is that we also then, it's not just stop with us because we hand on the information to the public health agencies, but we also make all of our data open access. Um, and we're very connected to um, experimental scientists who then look at mutations of of particular mutations that people are concerned about to look at, to try and get the evidence for how that might behave 
in the laboratory in terms of adhering to cells or growing in cells or you know, neutralization assays, which, uh, which we might uh, get on to talk more about in a minute, but how well antibodies from people neutralize or knock out the virus. So we're connected with people who do that work we're connected with immunologists and we're collected actually are connected with people who do host genetics as well do the human sequencing so we try and connect through the system um so that it doesn't just stop at us but it goes through uh, to the experimental side and in fact ravi is one of those people who might want to comment on on how that connects through to him and, and what happens once we've identified a mutation or a variant um that we're that we're concerned about mm. professor gupto you have anything to add on that Um, you have muted. Okay. Just that uh, that that the obviously Cogico has been incredibly successful and and um, uh, you know, it's driven by motivated individuals and you know um, excellent structures. Uh, so it's really quite a, 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 a nice example of of how people can come together for a common goal. And uh, the information we get from the sequencing side, as um, Sharon says, feeds in very quickly in some cases to uh, the in vitro work and we can turn around um, uh, sort of knowledge very, very quickly uh, when we pick up new variants and new mutations. Uh, and that, that uh, speed I think is important in terms of understanding what we want to do when we see new variants that are spreading uh, and, and, and to understand how concerned we might be and what sort of um, measures that we need to put in place at public health level. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of surveillance, I'm just curious to know that at what at what points are scientists um, confident to say that oh perhaps this surge of cases or infections in a country is due to variants. I'm just taking, for example, what is happening in India right now. I mean, we're seeing record high of cases every day and then it is like variant could be 1617 that is going on in the country. Uh, are there any evidence saying that the surge of infections is due to the variant there? My personal opinion, I think of, the, the, uh, of, of others is that what's happening in India really is the result of uh, relaxation of control measures. There have been very, very large um, religious gatherings uh, over the past few months. There have been political rallies. There have been very few restrictions on movements and gatherings, um, weddings, for example. And a lot of this was fueled by the fact that um, uh, the, the wave that India experienced in the middle of last year uh, was not particularly extreme. And there was a recovery with lockdown, um, that, uh, that being said. Um, but of course, in other countries experienced many waves after that when uh, restrictions were eased. And for some reason in India, the, 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 the surge in cases happened a little bit later than one may have, may have expected. So that's why people have uh, attributed this to the, the new variants that have been identified, for example, B117 in, 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 in parts of uh, India, such as Delhi and Punjab. And then further south, uh, the P six one uh, one point six seven one point six one seven. Um, so the 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 new variants may be contributing, but they're certainly not the 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 the, the reason this is happening. So I think that's important uh, to to bear in mind. Mm. And if I might come in and just add a bit more to that, um, I, I I agree, Ravi, with with your your assessment. I think that in order to uh, make a link between, uh, for example, transmissibility and um, the variant, you have to do a series of things. First of all, you have to collect uh, good surveillance data, and that needs to be as complete as possible. So how many people are getting infection in a given area? You know, so place and time, over time, how many cases are you getting? And that relies on good diagnostics. So um, you, can, uh, you can certainly gather as much information as you can about, about surging by, by region. Then you would need to do... Uh, uh, unbiased sampling, so that they would, that it would be unhelpful if you only if you had a country where there was a surge, but you only took isolates from one place for sequencing because it might not be representative of the whole country. So you need unbiased sampling to understand what the cause of that is. Now, having identified the uh, the, the 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 variant that's associated with that surge, you've then got the information that you need to do a combination of, of a modeling and phylogenetic analysis, that's using the genome data, to see whether that lineage 
is, is expanding more quickly than you might expect it to do. Um, but also to look at the, look at the epidemiology uh, and just see whether you believe that the number of cases that are increasing is more than you would expect. And you'd be, uh, you'd be looking at, at um, things like the R number um, and modeling around that. But it does come back to, in, in terms of in India, uh, then you know the careful epidemiology and the, the genomics. So we, we do have um, in the global database, GISAID, uh, genomes from India that we can study. Uh, but uh, it's one needs to know whether that was representative sampling from across the country, and if not, who that was from. And I agree um, with Rony that that uh, that much of this is likely to be due to um, our kind of non-pharmaceutical interventions or gatherings of people without face masks, etc. There may be a um, you know a proportion of that surge that's related to uh, variants. There is B117 in India, and that would explain um, the surging cases. And the role of the, the B1617, the so-called um, Indian variant, I think that, that that really needs to be confirmed. It could have a role, uh, but I don't think it's the only explanation uh, for what we're seeing in India. And so at the moment, it's a, it's a question of, of time before we can get the evidence, experimental evidence on, on that new uh, Indian lineage. Uh, but in the meantime, the response is that, that countries are are the steps they're taking in terms of getting vaccines uh, and oxygen to India is absolutely right because um, you know we need to kind of vaccinate ourselves out of the, the particular situations and um, you know, that's that's very helpful that people are actually contributing uh, towards mm. that. You mentioned vaccine, and I think there's actually many questions people they do have as well on the mm. impact of. Um, variants on, on the efficacy of vaccines. Um, Professor Gupta, I noticed that actually you have done a study before looking into the efficacy of the Pfizer-BioNTech uh, vaccines against the variants. And you found that actually it is less effective against the variant first identified in South Africa. Perhaps could you share more with us your insights about the impacts of variants and on the efficacy of vaccines? So the, obviously this was the big question when uh, B117 was um, identified because it was coinciding with uh, uh, you know, the uh, possibility of vaccines and, and, and positive data from the trials. So um, we, 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 we spent some time uh, looking at people who had had vac uh, the Pfizer vaccine, for example, and we found a, a small um, reduction in the, in the ability of um, antibodies uh, from patients who had been vaccinated to actually neutralize or block uh, SARS-CoV-2 virus, but it was a small amount, it was only something like twofold. Um, and then when we looked at viruses um, such as B117 with a particular mutation found in the South African variant, we found that found that, that changed more, you know, more towards the sort of sixfold range, which is certainly more substantial and where we start sort of getting worried that, you know, you may not be able to block infection at that level. And um, since then we have done studies with the actual South African spike variant uh, spike uh, sequence and also the brazilian and we find something quite similar that there is a similar sort of five-fold loss of in uh, of, of efficacy of, uh, of of antibodies that we generate uh, we've also tested um, plasma or antibodies from people who have been infected in the past and those seem to be more affected by the uh, the mutations uh, found in the south african or p um, b uh, 1.351 lineage uh, as well as the uh, in, in B117. So uh, vaccines seem to generate responses that may be more effective uh, against variants than previous infection, although there are many caveats to all of that analysis. So, so yes, there is, there is an effect on, on vaccines, but we have to remember that the, the, the human body makes a number of different responses, including uh, T cell responses against, um, against the virus, uh, these are all generated by, vac by vaccines. So uh, this explains why vaccines in general have been highly efficacious, even in places where variants are circulating. There's, there's one exception, which was the Oxford uh, AstraZeneca vaccine, which was, was, um, uh, didn't perform very well in South Africa. But then again, they were measuring um, infection in, in, in young people who generally did quite well. So they, they, were, they were screening them with PCR. So they're also picking up asymptomatic infections. So I think that shows you that 
vaccines will protect against severe illness and death in the majority of people, even if they have a variant, but people may still get infected and they may still transmit it. So that's the thing that we have to um, kind of close the loop on because we don't necessarily want uh, to uh, allow SARS-CoV-2 to transmit in the mm -hmm. vaccine era. Mm -hmm. But um, I mean, in the future, is there like a simpler way to explain to our audience that like how do scientists they modify the, the, the vaccines based on the variants we are seeing? I mean, how, how does it work? And, and I mean, with the emergence of variants, how does it affect the global vaccination strategy as well? well yeah, I mean, this is a really big question and scientists are gathering to discuss this. Uh, very question in terms of if you're going to modify the vaccine, which I think we should, uh, what do you do? How do you modify it? Which mutations are included? Um, I know that Moderna have started a, a safety and efficacy study, uh, uh, sorry, a safety and immunogenicity study. In other words, does the vac is the vaccine safe and um, does it generate immune responses? And they've, they've changed the vaccine to include the spike uh, protein from the, uh, the B1.351 which originated in South Africa. Um, so, so, so they've taken the entire um, sort of sequence from there. Now that's one approach because it's directed against one particular virus. But now that we're seeing, you know, for example, the, the variants in India, which have a different set of mutations, one wonders whether you will get adequate, adequate cross protection against the other variants. So we may end up having to make a cocktail of, 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 of spike proteins or, or, you know, but this is really uh, an emerging field uh, where we know very few of the answers at the moment. But, but would the technology be similar to the flu shots we're having every year? Because, I mean, the, the, the drug makers, they have like slightly changed the formula, if that's how I understand, based on the production on what strain is going to go prevalent. Is that, is that, yeah. is, is it going to be something similar? Like how it, it, that's one of the models that could be adopted. Of course, they're two different, quite different viruses. Um, and, you know, the, the, the flu model is based on being able to predict what's coming from the south, the south, you know, the, the southern hemisphere into the northern hemisphere um, over a period of a year. Now, uh, first of all, SARS-CoV-2 is not necessarily seasonal, so we're not sure we're going to be able to use that paradigm. But let's say we can still predict what's going to you know, spread around the world. I think that that, that will be a, a, a paradigm we use. We will either um, make mixtures of different spike sequences or we'll make one spike sequence with a number of different mutations on that same spike. That doesn't necessarily occur naturally, but is a kind of representation of what's around. But you have to be careful when you do that because we, there may be effects that we don't predict. For example, you may not get the sort of level of protection that you um, expect to just by adding everything up. So it's a little bit more complicated um, than just sort of taking the, the top 10 mutations and then making a spike protein with all those 10. Mm. So, 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 you know, the, I can't give you a, a firm answer on this. Mm. If, I, if I might come in as well, I think it's going to be um, much more um, uh, sort of messy, as it were, than, than flu, because there's not going to be a point in the year necessarily where we say, right, let's see what's going to come this year because it's not seasonal. So not only, uh, and the other, the other issue is that, that different variants are affecting different parts of the world. They often have the same type of functionality, um, but actually making sure that we get global representation is, 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 is going to be quite challenging. But the other issue is that we don't have sequencing in many parts of the world. We don't know what the variants are in those, in those countries. Uh, and some of those countries have very high rates of infection, which means that there's plenty of opportunity for the virus to mutate because it will only mutate when it's going through an infection cycle. So it, it's going to, I, I would anticipate it's going to be more uh, challenging, uh, more challenging than, than, than flu vaccination. Um, but we also need to really better understand what's called the correlates of, of immunological protection. So exactly what will, uh, what, what's likely to protect individuals. And Ravi may want to see more about that, but, uh, it, I just see it as a kind of more challenging process until we get into a cycle of or, or a, 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 a cycle of, of thinking about this and deciding how the vaccines are going to change. I don't know, Ravi, if you if you agree with that point that it's at this point in time it's feeling much more challenging than flu vaccinations. Yes, I think so uh, because this is we're still understanding how this virus behaves, whereas we we've learned how influenza behaves. 
um, over many years, and we're still in we're in year two of this new disease. So, uh, yeah, absolutely, uh, I think yeah. the correlates are going to be uh, important. Mm -hmm. I think human challenge studies will probably shed more light on on this disease. So I think um, uh, there, there will be some important information gained from 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 such investigations. Mm -hmm. But I mean, uh, what is your message right now to the public? Should they still get vaccines? You know, because of the of the variants. Certainly, my my recommendation is yes. Everyone should be vaccinated. I would not. I, I want to be vaccinated, and everyone I know, um, mm -hmm. even if there are variants out there which show in vitro, you know, reduced efficacy. Because we know from the studies and the trials, the big big trials with tens of thousands of people, that uh, that the vaccine will protect you against severe and severe um, consequences and death from the COVID nineteen, including the variants that have been studied. Mm. And I would echo that. It's really important that everybody goes and gets their vaccine. Uh, I've been vaccinated fully um, because of my age group, and um, I'm very pleased to have been vaccinated. Uh, I would encourage my family to be vaccinated. And so it's, it's really essential because they are effective. And in countries where vaccination uh, has been uh, rolled out extensively, uh, including Israel and the UK, we're beginning to see the benefits of that. And, and as Ravi says, it might not completely prevent disease, but it certainly uh, is going to drive down very much um, a death from, uh, from uh, COVID-19 and hospital admissions. That's very important in our setting because our hospitals went through a period where they were actually quite full of people with COVID-19 and that altered uh, the hospital's ability to treat other conditions. And so um, you know, it, it reduces disease severity, it will prevent disease um, and it will, it, it will be predicted to prevent transmission, but there's, there's this issue of allowing uh, hospitals to start to return to normal to treat people with heart disease and cancer and, and other conditions, which when we're in the kind of heat of the pandemic uh, can go so, somewhat off the kind of media radar, but uh, you know, they're really important and um, to, to prevent increasing harm to people who've got misdiagnoses or slow treatment, um, then the vaccination has a benefit uh, to those people as well as to uh, in relation to COVID. So it's good for everybody. Mm. Good. So I'm um, going to move on to uh, another area about the measures taken by some governments. Um, for example, we noticed that flight bans had been adopted by some governments against countries where variants and cases are increasing. Um, do you think it is actually an e effective measure, flight ban? I think it depends what you mean by effective and it depends what you mean by a flight ban. I and mean, certainly if you take New Zealand as an example, it's been highly effective what they've done. They've closed their borders. They're now in a bubble with, with Australia, but highly effective and, and they have controlled their borders very, very well indeed. Um, but uh, in many other countries, actually, including across Europe, uh, countries have actually got partial uh, uh, limitations and so in the UK for example we have what's called the red list and uh, so people can still travel but they need to go into hotel quarantine uh, when they return and in those countries uh, that is likely to be the borders are likely to be much more leaky and so uh, we uh, we do screen people who go who come home from holiday to, to home quarantine or hotel quarantine but you're not going to stop all variants actually coming in at that point, and therefore you need to be vigilant in terms of their introduction. So there's there's gradations in border control from absolute border control right the way down to no border control, and you can see that any level of border control would reduce the amount of introduction of disease and introductions of variants. And so I'm I'm supportive of border controls, but. I'm fortunate that actually it's not my job to make those decisions. That's down, down to government to decide. Uh, but I can see the absolute benefits. And then that's a balance for the government to decide between uh, shutting the borders and the impact on the economy, which I think is is um, a, a judgment for them. Mm. Professor Gupta, do you have any points to add on that about flight bans? Uh, just to say that uh, I agree with, with all of uh, the things Sharon said, and it is a very difficult area because countries are trying to balance the, uh, their economies with, uh, uh, with, uh, with, you know, with, with protection against uh, COVID-19 and, and transmission. Um, I think the examples of New Zealand are, are somewhat isolated just because 
you can't compare New Zealand with the United Kingdom, which is a, a global hub, and, and so much of our economy depends on the interactions with the rest of the world, whereas New Zealand, you couldn't say that for New Zealand um, by any stretch of the imagination. So I can, one can understand why certain, certain countries have done better through isolationist policies um, and why some countries have not been able to pursue that in a realistic way. Uh, but going forward, I think that the best way is, is to get vaccine coverage as high as we can mm -hmm. so that we can um, um, open up travel again, because I think it, it is really going to stagnation of the, the global economy in this way is not something that's sustainable. Mm. My, my final question is that about the impact of variants and our path in returning to normalcy. How would you see that it would be um, uh, affected or whether it would be hampered? If I mean the coronavirus variants have gone rampant around the world, around the world, is it going to be like much slower? Our path of returning to normalcy. Um, so I, I mean, I, I think we'll, but we can both comment on this because it's really mm. important. It's probably the most important question, isn't it? Does mm. our variants going to slow us all down and getting back to normal? I think the, the answer is yes. It is going to slow us down, and rightly so because. It's basically a signal that we haven't quite won yet, you know, um, and I think if we slow down a bit, we are less likely to get into trouble again in the future. Um, but of course, the pressures are enormous for getting back to normal. We're already hearing from our prime minister that we, we're going to open up fully by June 21st, even though we don't quite know what's happening with B1.617 in the UK and globally. We know that numbers are going up. So um, you can see from that that there is enormous pressure to just get back to normal. Uh, uh, we are ramping up vaccination, but we're still not near where, where we need to be. So a number of scientists in the UK are, are sort of echoing my, my worries and saying, look, let's just wait a little bit longer because we could get it right and then avoid problems later on. Um, but Sharon, I don't know if you agree with that or not. Yes, I do broadly. I mean, I would make a slightly different point, and that is that the way to prevent variants from emerging is actually to uh, uh, dampen down disease because I've said before that variants emerge through intense human to human transmission and particularly in partially uh, uh, partially immune populations where you have some people who are immune but others that are not and so if we if we can dampen down uh, uh, infection worldwide uh, through vaccination that is our best chance actually of controlling variants is to control is to control disease and then it's a question of how much travel occurs across the world, whether a particular event emerges in one part of the world, uh, travels to another. It's quite an interesting uh, philosophical point to say, can you, once a variant has emerged, can you stop it in its tracks? It would be nice to think you could, but I haven't seen any evidence of that so far. Once a variant emerges, you can't seem to sort of, it's like getting a, a it's like trying to stop it in its tracks is very difficult, particularly if it's got a fitness advantage, it will then start to transmit. And its level of transmission will depend on whether the, the population is vaccinated and whether there's travel. So I would say that variants will be something that we'll be talking about this time next year and you know in, in, in several years, because it's something we'll need to keep our eyes on as we develop our vaccines. And and any any change that's likely to lead to a major vaccination shift or even a minor vaccination shift is something that we're going to be concerned about for the coming years. So variants will. Uh, uh, be something that we're going to be talking about for some time to come. I very much hope that if people get the vaccination, that it won't be slowing us down too much. But when I say get the vaccination, that means global get the vaccination. And because we've heard many times from people that we need to vaccinate the whole world uh, before we can uh, really get control of the disease. And that's such an important imperative for, for us to think about how other people who are less fortunate um, uh, financially can get their vaccines um, in a timely way. Mm. So um, we'll now move on to Q&A session from the audience. We've received quite a lot of questions from our audience. So um, we have this question here asking that, so how would you compare COVID and MERS? Which one is more severe, do you think? Professor, um, perhaps... Professor. Do you want to start? I, I can have a go as well, but... Um, okay. Would... Well, yeah, I mean, MERS... Uh, well, which is more severe? Well, MERS specifically targeted people in their older years and who had, you know, pre-existing medical conditions such as diabetes and respiratory 
system issues. Um, and very, very few cases in young people, as far as I can remember. Um, the viruses are, they have many similarities, there's no doubt. Um, of course, the, the uh, animal reservoir was, you know, camels, for example, uh, in, in MERS, and uh, it, it, for, for SARS, we're still not sure. Um, but uh, the, but I think, well, I think SARS-CoV-2 is, is certainly more severe. Um, uh, I don't think there's much doubt. Also, the, the important thing is that this is a multi-system disease. We know that this virus uses a different receptor to gain entry um, uh, to cells, and the ACE2 receptor is present on an, a range of different cell types. And that probably explains a lot of its biological and clinical consequences in terms of long COVID potentially and you know, cardiac problems and gastro gastrointestinal problems that arise during infection. So there are very different viruses. I think SARS-CoV-2 is worse um, and it's a multi-system disease. Mm. I was just going to say that the burden of disease, uh, MERS hasn't caused millions of deaths and hundreds of millions of cases. And so um, although MERS obviously uh, was of importance to the pe people that were affected, um, SARS-CoV-2 is, is clearly in a different league. Uh, one of the things that, that MERS did uh, contribute to certain parts of the world was an ability to learn about pandemic response. And so in many ways, um, MERS and SARS actually allowed some countries to really learn to prepare themselves so that when SARS-CoV-2 came along, they were very well prepared. Um, and so it's you wouldn't want to say that any emerging virus was of benefit, but overall to the countries that were well prepared, well, you know, that was great, you know, that, that, they, that they were able to be to be at the ready to respond. Right. Okay, I will move on to another question. I'll, there are two questions that are quite similar. I'll combine them. So they're asking that um, as per the current situation, will more and more variants be expected to emerge? And if there are other variants in the future, will they be expected? Will are they expected to be more dangerous and the spreading power be more, be more vigorous? So both questions are talking about mm. what are we seeing in the future? Mm. I'll start, then um, uh, Ravi can see what he thinks of my answer. But my own sense at the moment is that um, when the virus first emerged, it was very fit. It could transmit and we were, all had lack of immunity, so it spread across the world. Um, by kind of... Uh, September, October, the virus was was shifting to a new population uh, where many people were uh, had immunity, and so we've seen this second fitness peak, uh, whereby uh, the virus is beginning to transmit better and uh, at least partially avoid our immune systems. What I couldn't say with any confidence is what comes after that, whether there's going to be another fitness peak that looks very different or whether we're going to have um, so, uh, 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 a variant that emerges with, uh, of very high consequence, i.e. It, it's completely immune to uh, the current vaccines. On a positive note, um, vaccination strategies and, and um, uh, new approaches are being developed all the time. And so I do remain hopeful that vaccination will, will be there for us in, in the longer term. But I don't think that well, certainly I haven't heard of anybody who could, who could very reliably predict what's going to happen next. I, th I think it's likely that there's going to be more variants arising. I think those variants are likely to have the same changes, the mutations that the current variants have, because there appears to be an advantage in getting that kind of constellation of changes. But the question is whether the virus would then tolerate another kind of leap in its evolution to become quite different, for example, fully resistant to vaccines. And I don't think I'm qualified to say, I don't know if anybody is, but I'd be really pleased to hear from them if they are. But Ravi might know the answer. <laughs> well, yeah, I'd, I'd agree with all of those, those, those points. And uh, I, I personally don't think that um, the virus is going to become more pathogenic. I mean, what it will do is escape more immunity. And, you know, as I said earlier, at the moment we, we say get vaccinated because the vaccine will protect you from severe illness and death. Um, that's because we still have lots of immune pressure on the virus uh, when it infects you and we control it. What will happen in the future is if we don't do anything and there's still more transmission, the virus will you know, acquire more mutations and more ability to escape all of the immunity. And then it may get back to where it was before, which is to cause you know, the same amount of 
illness and death as it did in the in the beginning, or that we're seeing now, for example, in 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 um, in many parts of the world, such as Brazil and India. So, um, and and the other thing to bear in mind is, of course, the the negative effects of SARS-CoV-2 are partly driven by our immune responses. So we get a lot of inflammation. Uh, and some people have more inflammation than others, and we think this dr potentially drives some of the really severe effects. So, a lot of a certain proportion of the the badness or the you know the illness you know uh, from from this virus is due to um, the way we respond to the virus, and so that you know that needs to be factored in. So, I, overall, I think it's unlikely we'll see a worse virus, but we may see a virus that requires broader vaccination um, uh, to keep up with it. Mm. Okay. Oh, I'll move on to another question. So um, an audience has asked that, how do you tell the difference and the difficulties of the measurements between the past outbreaks? I assume he or she is asking about past outbreaks of other diseases and the COVID-19 outbreak. So the differences and difficulties in measuring the current outbreak and the past outbreaks we saw? Well, I, I will start. Um, what I would say is that, that for me, I, I have never lived through anything like this before. And so um, when we think about the way we responded to MERS, to SARS, to uh, the influenza um, in 2009, um, it feels very different now because the, the whole world is involved. Uh, there are very high uh, uh, levels of, of, of people dying. Um, and so we, uh, this feels completely different to anything I've ever experienced. What I would say is we have a, a, a repertoire of, of scientific tools and that we didn't have before. So one of the big differences for me is uh, the speed at which vaccines have been developed. So the mRNA vaccines are an incredible scientific leap forward. And that's going to actually influence a lot of our infectious diseases control in the future because it can be adapted to other diseases. So in compared with, with previous infectious diseases, we have this ability to create new uh, vaccines. But in addition, in the past, we didn't use sequencing, for example, in the same way that we're using now. So sequencing was applied to, uh, to viruses uh, retrospectively looking backwards, which told us a bit about the virus and about, about the transmission, but it was all too late by then. Uh, it's been a revolution to be able to sequence uh, viral genomes at the rate that we have because we can actually start to use that proactively uh, and to inform our vaccines, to inform our treatments. And so there are so many differences between this and anything else we've had, but we do have a lot more scientific capability um, compared to what we had even uh, five or ten years ago. Mm. Okay. Let's see. Um, I'll move on to another question asking about um, the government performances. So they're asking, what is your assessment now on how effective different governments are at controlling the pandemic? Which country do you think perform best? A Perhaps. tricky question and uh, hence the silence between us. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> Well, I mean, you know, one may say that China, being the first country that to uh, or, or to experience the, the the virus, did a pretty good job in limiting its spread. Um, in that, the wave was shut down, and uh, with with uh, with very targeted, you know, um, uh, interventions since then. Uh, at, you know, example for example, mass testing at huge scale. Uh, in uh, to, to to limit outbreaks at local level has been seems to have been effective. Um, of course, there has been significant travel restriction to China. Um, of course, New Zealand is 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 heralded as a as, as a success story, but has a very low population density and many other attributes which make it a low risk place for high levels of transmission. Anyway, um, so I think that maybe those two stand out, uh, for example. But uh, you know, other countries that that were hubs of you know travel uh, we're always going to experience um uh, sort of worse um uh, outbreaks i mean i guess the city states hong kong and singapore have come off fairly well um overall and that's fantastic i'm not sure necessarily whether that's due to i mean i know that in singapore they had a very stringent and um uh, uh, uh effective policy but it did limit um 
movements and uh, uh, it was a very it was quite a, it was a severe lockdown last year uh, and but and interestingly the resurgence in cases in Singapore or these small outbreaks have been uh, in 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 um, communities that are in poor housing conditions high density usually um, usually uh, um, immigrant um, uh, immigrant workers and so that is highlighted in a way also uh, um, uh, an important aspect of all this which is that many countries that have high incomes um, depend on uh, um, you know low paid workforces um, and this you know this is an interesting sort of moral sort of dilemma for, for places that needs to be addressed i think but anyway i'll stop there and let um uh, Sharon mm. continue. thank you avi um my my answer to this is uh straightforward i think the historians will decide because what i've seen over time is that initially some countries were considered to be uh you know almost on a pedestal they were kind of revered for their their effectiveness but actually over time, uh, there's been a leveling up of how countries have responded. And so some countries started quite slowly and have sped up in their response. Some countries did very well from the outset. Mm. And so, and we're not, we're not there yet. I mean, we, we feel as if we've been doing this for a long time, but we're at the very beginning of, of, of this particular virus. You know, let's hope it becomes uh, like flu uh, in the future. But what I think is there's still time to go yet for governments and countries to demonstrate how effective they're being um, in both controlling disease and balancing their economy. And I think that the historians will be busy writing about this uh, for a very long time. And I think that they will actually have um, the last word on this. Mm. Okay, I'll move on to a question again about vaccination. So this person asked that social distancing and face masks will still be needed after vaccination. How do you persuade people to adhere to it? I think what that person means is how would you persuade people to adhere to vaccination? Um, uh, I'm not, I didn't understand totally, but I mean, that, that's what the question is. Well, I think, yeah, sorry, go ahead. No, no, after you, Rabbi. Um, I, would, I would say there's, there's a really important point in there, actually, because um, Sharon and I are both vaccinated fully and still wearing masks everywhere. And, and that's because um, many people still are not vaccinated and there is transmission going on. And we could theoretically be infected if we didn't mount an adequate response. There are people out there who, who have uh, underlying conditions who are not responding to vaccines in the same way as others. And so uh, that's, a, that's a situation where people still can be infected and transmit. Um, and until we know more about this and until more of the population is vaccinated, we should continue those. And I don't have a problem with it. It's also a reminder to all of us that there, there is still a problem in this country. It hasn't gone away and it could come back very easily. So reminding ourselves that there is a pandemic ongoing through the symbol of a face mask, I think is still quite powerful. Hmm. Professor Peacock, you have. Well, I, I, I agree with, with Ravi. Uh, vaccination doesn't protect you completely fr uh, from, uh, from infection and from passing that infection on. Um, it's likely that you're less transmissible, but you could have asymptomatic infection. And if I'm around people who haven't been vaccinated or haven't mounted a good immune response, I'd want to I'd want to make sure that I was playing my part. And for me, wearing a face mask is has been an unusual experience. But now I don't even think about it twice. I'm really, really used to wearing face masks, and I'll continue to wear face masks until I think it's completely safe to not not to do so. Um, so there are circumstances when I won't wear a face mask when I'm outdoors on my own. Um, uh, you know, or indoors with my family, but otherwise I have a very low threshold for putting on a face mask. Um, uh, so as you know, I think that I think that's the that's the correct course of action, certainly from my perspective at the moment. I want to ask one follow up question. So, when are we seeing this? You know, points that we could be totally mask free. When are we confident to do that? I think it's a quick answer. We don't know yet because we haven't got the evidence. And I, and I also think that each country will have to make their own decisions about, about 
where they are in the pandemic. So it could be that there's a point in time when you could stop wearing them, but each country will have a different uh, level. I think the work has to go on to see what effect it would have to stop wearing masks versus wearing masks when you're at the tail end of the pandemic rather than at the beginning of the pandemic. But I also think it's where actually culturally there's there was quite a big difference when we first went into the pandemic about the acceptability of wearing masks. So in the UK, people didn't wear masks and it was it was really unusual for us to do that. But in some cultures, people are actually very happy to wear masks. And in fact, they were wearing masks before the pandemic came along. So there isn't a single kind of answer because um, of all of those elements that, that kind of play in together. Mm. Okay, one final question from the audience. Um, what would your advice be to the state's leaders in dealing with the pandemic? Um, I think I, I could make a sort of brief statement to say in terms of world leaders that, that of course, uh, people want to get back to, uh, you know, stimulating their economies, um, repaying, borrowing, restarting travel and industries. Uh, and that is, that is certainly the goal. But um, investment in uh, detection of infections and, um, and obviously uh, encouraging and uh, enabling vaccination is really important and just to temper the kind of drive to open up and uh, get back to normal just to be tempered by uh, uh, what we've learned so far uh, and to be safe in terms of going forward so so to look at the sort of medium to long term uh, rather than just the short term and i would say three things the first is look after your own people by listening to scientists and the, and the best evidence you can and making the right decisions uh, the second is uh, look after other people. So if you have vaccines to spare, please give them away and make sure that we're looking after other people. And I think the third thing is uh, prepare for the next one. Make sure that you're ready. Hmm. Okay, so I think um, because of time, limits, time limit, I'm afraid our discussion um, needs to come to an end. Um, thank you very much, Professor Sharon Peacock and Professor Ravi Gupta for joining us from the UK. And thank you everyone in the audience for joining us today as well. I hope that you have been inspired as much as I do. I do have learned a lot from the sharing and insights from the two experts. So um, we'll see you next time in the next Asia Society webinar on COVID virus. Bye-bye. Thank you and bye-bye. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.